Wait till I start pounding with them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look at this guy sitting back with his arms crossed. He's like, mimicking somebody else. He looks comfy. Yeah, man. Are we crazy? He's probably quite comfortable. Yeah. Undermine my door. I don't know. 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 started with our next session. Uh, my name is Sean Dalton. I'm the lab field manager here for the Regional Science Consortium. Um, our first presentation of this session will be from Jonathan Townsend, who is a PhD student from the University at Buffalo, and he will talk about chiropterin chatter in Chautauqua, New York. I probably said that wrong. Hopefully everybody picked up on the regulation. I worked on that for the first four semesters of my program. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Thank you. Great, so um, my name's John. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Department of Geography at the University of Buffalo, where I'm working on uh, biogeographical analyses of bat habitat use and uh, the way of like species distribution monitoring or modeling and things like that. And what I'm presenting on today is actually the first published article of my PhD research, so it's kind of exciting for me to be able to be here presenting on this. It's also fairly important for my program because as the title of my article implies, this is kind of setting the stage that I'm building the rest of my research on as I work through the program. So I'll just dive on in and get started and talk about how I've been using these bioacoustic bat surveys to model um, bat habitat use using GIS. But before we get too far ahead, we should get a little bit of background information on bats in general. So they belong to the order Chiroptera, so that's where the Chiropterin chatter in Chautauqua title came from. They are the only true flying mammal, so if you've heard of flying squirrels and flying lemurs, they're just kind of falling with style, they're not really capable of true flight. And bats have tremendous diversity, they're present on every continent except Antarctica, because bats are very sensible, they're not going to live on Antarctica anyways. And they're very diverse in terms of species as well. There's over 1,400 species of bat described by science, which puts them at about the second most numerous order of mammals next to rodents. But I'm studying bats for a particular reason. They aren't just really cute things to look at, right? So they are keystone species, which means they have an exaggerated impact on the ecosystems that they inhabit. They're indicators of biological complexity and ecological health, so where you have diverse bat assemblages, you tend to have healthy ecosystems. And as apex predators, they have a number of important uh, ecosystem and economic services wherever they live. So one of the most important economic services that bats are recognized for is pollination. There's over 500 species of plant Many of them not just important to the environment, but important to human ecosystems or human economies. And uh, there's many species of plant that are entirely dependent on bats for pollination. This is called uh, chiropto chiroptophilus pollination syndrome, which is a syndrome we all would like to have. But I love this picture by Dr. Merlin Tuttle because it really nicely illustrates where mm -hmm. the stamen is brushing up on the forehead of this bat. It illustrates that coevolutionary relationship where um, this species of tank plant has evolved its stamen to curve and brush up onto the forehead of that foraging bat. Another important service that bats provide is seed dispersal. So um, a study from Bat Conservation International looked at a very common species of Latin American and South American bat called Ceiba short-tailed fruit bat. And just a colony of 400 individuals was able to distribute over um, hundreds of millions of seeds every year. And it's true that where they study tropical rainforests that have been completely clear-cut, the trees that regrow after that clearing 
are trees that are known to be consumed, the fruits are known to be consumed by bats. So bats are dispersing these seeds and are quite literally reforesting the landscape while they do that. But looking at the services that are more close to what we have here in western New York, or sorry, northwest Pennsylvania, <clears throat> um, all of our bats in most of the northeast United States, most of North America, or sorry, the United States, um, are insectivores, so they eat insects. And in a study of just 150 big brown bats, which is shown in the picture here, these researchers found that these bats either consume directly or control through consumption of gravid female insects laden with eggs. And I don't want to make you do math today, so I spent another couple semesters compiling these numbers together, but I'm joking. If you uh, look at this by a per bat number, each individual big brown bat is controlling insect populations to the tune of a quarter million every summer. And like I said, this is one of the most common species of bat in the Northeast United States. So they are providing the wealth of um, ecosystem services in terms of insect control, but also the uh, economic services to our agricultural industry. Because if you look at that far right column in the table here, the crops that these insects damage are things like cucumbers, corn, cotton, apples, industry fruit, or um, nursery fruits and things like that. So very important in terms of not only protecting us and our crops, but also keeping the insect populations in check in the natural world. But despite being really critical things in the environment, like I've been describing, uh, there's conservation issues facing bats throughout the world. Some of these issues like climate change and habitat destruction are things that most organisms around the planet are being subjected to. I think bats are kind of uniquely subjected to human persecution because people think that they're evil and dirty and filled with diseases, none of which is true. In our region, bats are most impacted by two conservation stressors, white nose syndrome and wind energy related bat mortality. So just a, a little bit of information on those two major conservation issues, white nose syndrome is a disease caused by the fungus Pseudogymnoascus destructans. It impacts colonial cave hibernating species of bat, and it has led to the declines of several species of bat of, from 90 to 99 percent. So some of our most common mammals in North America, not just bat species, but common mammals, have had 99 percent declines. And New York has the claim of fame of being where the place where white nose syndrome was first discovered. So. It's been on the landscape since the winter of 2006 and 7, and it was discovered in the eastern part of New York State. And so what I have here is the kind of disease spread map. So we've probably seen some things like this in relation to COVID, but right here where this X is, is where the disease was first discovered, where biologists would go and do regular winter hibernacula surveys. <laughs> Instead of counting live bats sleeping throughout the winter, they just found hundreds of thousands of dead bats outside of these cave entrances. And since then, you can see the disease has spread throughout most of the United States and portions of Canada. And by 2016, it was first discovered and located in Washington state. So that kind of took it from being more of an eastern seaboard United States issue to, you know, coast to coast. The other major issue in our region facing bats is related to wind energy development. Wind energy kills bats through du direct collision with the spinning turbine blades, as well as a phenomenon called barotrauma, which is the, uh, the differential vortices created from those spinning turbines can actually rupture the sensitive tissues and capillaries in bats' brains and lungs. So that's not really a common way that bats die from these turbines, but that does happen. And hundreds of thousands of bats are killed every year in the United States alone from wind energy related mortality. And where white nose syndrome was impacting colonial cave hibernating species of bat, wind energy development impacts foliage roosting solitary migratory species of bat. So our two main groups of bats in the region each have a very serious conservation pressure on them. And this is important to consider because 2020 showed the greatest increase in wind energy development on record. And obviously climate change is real. We want to address this. So we're going to be putting up more turbines. Uh, so it's really important that we get a handle on this right now. And it's particularly important because modeling is suggesting if you can read that 
tiny little uh, red triangle or rectangle there. <coughs> um, wind turbines kill bats. We know they kill migratory bats. And modeling of the impact of wind energy on the species hoary bat, which is this cute little guy here, is suggesting that populations could decline by as much as 90% over the next coming decades. So this was a 2017 article. Uh, the one researcher, Winifred Frick, went and updated this modeling just last year, and they found that hoary bats would experience a 50% decline by 2028. And looking at the quote from the bottom, they're suggesting that the current fatality rate for this species is such that it may already have caused substantial decline in populations. And this is serious for bats more than some other organisms because bats are slow to reproduce and long-lived. And those two characteristics in wildlife tend to make population crashes more difficult to rebound from. And so this is what I'm focusing my PhD research on doing. I want to address these bat conservation issues through better understanding of how bats are interacting with habitat. And so this will help me understand the important habitat features on the landscape that we either want to conserve and protect, or maybe in terms of like wind energy development, don't put turbines here because you might be more likely to kill hoary bats if you put them here versus there, and that in a nutshell. And to do that, I'm using data on bat activity that I'm collecting through bioacoustic bat surveys that um, use ultrasonic microphones coupled with specialized software to analyze the bat echolocation calls that I record. And so going back to the, the literature article that I'm presenting on today, my hypothesis for that was that bat morphology would have a strong impact on bat habitat use. And what I mean by that, for example, is looking at the aspect ratio and wing loading of a bat. These are kind of proportions of the bat's body uh, in relation to, for example, aspect ratio is the proportion of wing length to wing breadth. And wing loading is the proportion of the bat's weight to the area of the <coughs> wing membrane. And so you can see that, for example, with low wing loading, high aspect ratio, that little square in the top left, you would have a bat that is a slow, open air flyer capable of long distance migration, where a bat with high wing loading and low aspect ratio would be a bat that flies fast in cluttered environments. So you're looking at a difference between a bat that's flying in an open landscape and a bat that would be flying on like the interior of a forest. And so I wanted to kind of walk you through some of the methods I use to do that. And I think the most important method to cover would be the bioacoustic bat surveys, because that's kind of what I'm uh, basing almost all of this on. So you might know that bats echolocate, so that's they're essentially flying around screaming very, very loudly, so loudly we can't hear it. And by emitting these ultrasonic vocalizations, they're able to interpret the resulting echo that comes back. And they can tell not only uh, where obstacles are at, so they can navigate through cluttered landscapes, they're also using that to forage. So they can tell where an insect is at, what direction it's flying, the speed that it's flying, and what species of insect it is, all through using this biological sonar. And scientists like me can use the uh, echolocation calls to study bats and identify what species of bat you've recorded without ever actually physically seeing the bat. <clears throat> and we use the search phase of a bat's call. So bat's calls have three phases, the search, approach, and terminal phase. And the search phase of the bat's call is kind of like flying around, flashing its head beat, its headlights. And so this is a standardized version of their call that they're using um, just flying around, constantly echolocating. So it would be a typical call that would be similar for that species wherever you're recording it, right? And so using um, this property of echolocation and following the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's protocols, I was doing these surveys using a bat detector or a bat microphone that's on the roof of my car and driving a predetermined survey route or transect that's 20 miles long. And as I'm driving, I'm keeping a certain speed so that I'm matching the bat's flying speed. And so what this does is it ensures that each individual bat call I record is from a different individual bat. So if I just go and put a microphone up, I really have no way of telling if there's one bat circling twice or two bats circling once, that makes sense. 
So that's why the state uses this protocol so they can do population level uh, monitoring on these bat species. That's what it looks like. Uh, it doesn't look too fancy, but it's an ultrasonic microphone encased in PVC tube with a magnetized bottom that sits on the roof of my car. And we use binary acoustic technologies model AR125. So after the surveys, I've recorded all of this data. The bat calls are recorded like a typical sound file, a dot wave. And you use the specialized software to plot these calls in what's called a spectrogram, which is essentially a graph of sound with uh, frequency plotted against time. And then using different characteristics of the bat's call, you can uh, look closely using the software and identify what species you have. So on the left, I have a table from this report that shows the, the different species I recorded and the different parameters we would use to identify. You have CF versus FM, which means constant frequency versus frequency modulated. And so the, the call here, which is the hoary bat, tends to have a constant frequency call. You can see it's much flatter, where the uh, little brown bat shown here would be frequency modulated, a, a very steep call that starts at a much higher frequency and ends at a much lower frequency. And these are the two acoustic transects that I used in this research. On the left in A is the Jamestown transect, which runs from about Bear Lake to Jamestown in Chautauqua County. And on the right under B is the Arkwright transect, which is kind of the north central portion of Chautauqua County at a higher elevation. Before I went out and did any bat surveys, I did a habitat delineation along the 30 miles of roadside transect. And so I, these are the habitat types and the definitions I use to map that out. So every time the habitat shifted, I had the fun job of driving really slow in my car with a GPS unit out the window and just kind of collecting uh, habitat data in that way. And then uh, some of this information is repeated on the, on the right. Those are the call parameters that I used to identify, but I wanted to include this table because it shows the sample size and species diversity on the left. So I recorded several species of bat during the, the course of the summer's research. And you can see that four of the species at the top were uh, much more commonly recorded than the others. And so now that I had uh, my data collected and I had my habitat delineated, I went through and did three different kind of major steps in the analysis. The first one was just looking at the proportion of bat calls for a given habitat type that were recorded. The second was a statistical analysis using mixed models regression. And then the third was an analysis in GIS that calculated the point density of bat echolocation calls and plotted them over a land cover land use map. So here we have the proportion of bat calls for a given habitat type. Uh, of, of interest here is that 70 some percent of the bat calls I recorded had forest as a component of the habitat. And some of you math whizzes in the crowd might look at this and be like, well those percentages add up to way over 100. That's because if you're on a road, you could have a forest on your left and an agricultural field on your right. So that makes it kind of interesting to try to uh, study and model in this way, but that's why those proportions add up to way over 100%. And then the, the mixed models regression analysis showed uh, multiple significant results in bat habitat interactions. But the information you can glean from this is a little limited in that these interactions are relative to the other species of bat in the model. They aren't a reflection of one species of bat having a specific interaction with one habitat type. And that was due to limitations in the experimental design of the initial research. But looking at the uh, point density overlay with land cover, you do see some interesting interactions taking place. So here we have the um, Casadega Creek watershed and the Jamestown transect running through. The little black dots that you see are all individual bat calls that I recorded. And then those gray black blobs over top of those points is point density of bat calls per square kilometer, which was calculated in ArcMap GIS. And so what this does is gives us a visualization of where there's high bat calling density and where there's low bat calling density. And you do see patterns kind of showing through that. So right here with the white background, it helps you just see the, the bat calling density. And then on the uh, land cover background, you can see that where bat call density tends to decline, 
is directly over top a large agricultural field. So that was really interesting. It kind of, um, I talked about bats having a, a positive impact on agriculture. So if they're not foraging over agricultural fields, it's kind of interesting to see uh, those types of relationships. And this is stuff that I'm hoping to kind of get more information on as I'm working through my research. So that is, in a really quick nutshell, the literature article that I, um, that I published last year. In the next steps, I will be addressing those experimental design limitations by doing logistic regression analysis. Um, I've gotten a over 10-year data set from the state that I'm working with. We've georeferenced these bat calls, and we've created pseudo-absence points. So now I have presence of bats and absence of bats, and I can create habitat suitability maps using uh, those two different types of uh, data variables. Uh, just another couple quick slides on next steps over the next year or so. I spent the summer doing additional bat surveys in Chautauqua County, so in addition to the Jamestown transect in black, I added the Lake Erie transect in red, Ball Hill transect in yellow, and Niobe transect in that lighter blue, and then I mixed in a whole lot of other point samples so that we can address um, biases in terms of bat species that would forage around roads and bat species that forage in interior habitats. So this will give me a more well-rounded analysis when I conduct my uh, final species distribution modeling, which will be, um, over the next year or so, I'll be taking all of my bat data and throwing it into a big statistical analysis using uh, bat data as well as most or all of these uh, different data types that you see on the left. And so I think I'm just about out of time, but these are all the references that nobody can read. And um, I don't know if I have questions or time for, I don't have questions, but um, I don't know if I have time for questions, but you're we happy to. do uh, one or two quick ones. Sure. Sure. I'll stop staring. No, you're fine. Yes? Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, which species you detected most recently um, and species that maybe you expected but didn't detect at all? Well, I, I actually, I'll answer your second question first. I had species I didn't expect but did detect, so that speaks to issues with the acoustic identification of bats. I had um, records of Indiana bats, which are federally endangered but have never been documented in Chautauqua County and aren't thought to be in the area. And so that's an issue in the process of species ID in the genus Myota. Some of the bats in that genus can look very similar. Um, the, the most species I recorded were big brown, silver haired, eastern red, and hoary bats. Yeah? Any interest in doing those in Northwest PA? Of course. Let's <laughs> talk. Yeah, we'll clone me first and then we'll, yeah, we'll right. definitely talk about that. All right, thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Our next presentation is Sarah Till from Gannon University on a census of the bat population of Gannon University. So before I get into all of our data that we have collected over the past 15 years, I'm just going to go through a couple quick things about bats. You've learned a lot about bats from the previous presentation, and some of this is, a, is an overlap. But So bats are the only mammals that are capable of true flight. So like the previous presentation said, you might think of like flying squirrels and flying lemurs, uh, but they actually glide. They don't have the capability of true flight like bats do. Bats also make up about a quarter of the mammal species, so you can see how important they are. Um, there's about 1,000 species of bats, or 1,100 species of bats, and they live almost everywhere in the world except for extreme regions like desert and polar regions where they wouldn't have sustainable food source. They also feed at night and sleep during the day as they are nocturnal creatures, and even though they do a lot of really important things like pollinating flowers, dispersing seeds, and eating millions of insects, they've been scientifically neglected until recently. 
uh, very big in the news since its appearance in 2006, has been whiteness syndrome, which is a fungal disease that affects hibernating bats. So whiteness syndrome is caused by a cyprophilic or cold-loving fungus known as Pseudogymnoascus destructans. And caves provide a cool, damp environment that is um, optimal for the growth of this fungus. And since over half of all U.S. bat species hibernate in caves, you can see how detrimental this could be to bats. The fungus itself will usually manifest on the face, ear, tail, and wings, more on that later, and they're viable for an extended period of time. So, like I said, it can manifest on multiple di different areas on the bat's body, but I want to point out the one in the bottom left, especially when it gets on their wings. This can be really detrimental to them in the long run because their wings are so thin and membranous that they can scratch um, like micro holes into the wings and cause tiny little pairs that will over time scar and affect their flight patterns. So white nose syndrome is essentially like the worst case of athlete's foot that you could ever possibly imagine. So while it doesn't exactly cause the direct death of the bats, it does cause them to wake up during hibernation and at which point they scratch like crazy, they'll end up using up all these fat reserves that they've taken the time to build up over the winter and this will cause them to then want to leave their caves. They want to go find some sort of food source so they can replenish their energy. Now, like the picture shows, they go out in the middle of winter and there is no food source out there. And so they end up dying outside of the caves. And it can also suppress their immune systems as well. It is so bad that mortality is approached 100% in some caves. And since its discovery in 2006, it's already killed over seven and a half million bats prompting researchers to call it the most precipitous wildlife decline in the past century of North America. So I want to take a, t a little bit of time to talk about this map. Um, you saw a similar one in the previous presentation, but essentially white nose syndrome appeared in 2006 in a cave in Albany, New York. Uh, there is a strain of white nose syndrome that was in Europe prior to white nose syndrome in America, but researchers have done a lot of research, don't think that these two are very similar to one another, they're not exactly connected. So. It appeared in, in the United States in 2006 in Albany, New York, and for the most part, it stayed over on the eastern side of the country for quite a few, quite a few years. But you can see uh, 2016 up through like 2019, it has started to spread to the western part of the United <coughs> States. And now it's not exactly plausible that this is a bat that's brought it over like this. They don't typically have a migratory pattern like that. It's actually more plausible that it was spelunkers or cave hikers that brought it over to this part of the United States. So this can happen because the spores, like I said, are viable for an extended period of time. It can get caught on uh, shoes, caving, uh, different caving materials like backpacks and hooks, things like that. And if their gear isn't properly cleaned after, after exiting a single cave system and coming over the other side of the country and going to another cave, they can end up spreading it to these parts. Um, it's actually caused researchers to put up bars and caves to kind of separate humans from getting to the areas where they know that a lot of bats will end up hibernating. So our major concerns at this point are twofold. First is extinction. <coughs> um, just recently, a fourth bat has been added to the federally endangered species list for bats. Um, nine species have been affected, and our strategy then at this point is management and conservation of bats and their habitats in the path of whiteness syndrome. There's also a trifecta of an environmental, agricultural, and financial impact. So if we have these creatures that eat millions of insects, we end up having, you know, exponentially more insects in the United States. This can even kind of spread to an issue as far as um, insect spread diseases, such as malaria and less now. So at this point, we have a decrease in the number of insect eating bats, which causes an increased need for chemical pesticides. Um, this is harmful both agriculturally and it's very expensive. So you can see just how big of an effect white nose syndrome has on, on the United States. So some treatment methods. So researchers at Georgia State University have developed an antifungal agent known as um, Rhodococcus rhodocry, and it's been shown to slow mold growth on ripening fruit. And this was done in a study where they took 75 bats and they treated them by hand and then let them go um, throughout the winter. When they came back to check on them, all 75 had survived. So that shows that this was an effective method. Um, however, it's not, while it's effective, it's not really, a, you know, in the long run, it's, it's not a good method because we can't do hand treatment over a long period of time. So that's prompted research 
Thus prompted different places to look at devices that can modulate widespread dispersal of these compounds. Back Conservation International, who had made the map that I showed you a little bit ago, they collaborated with researchers from Western Michigan and Ball State University to develop an antifungal agent known as Kytosan. And they've also looked into volatile organic compounds, essential oils, and other compounds that they could use a nebulizer type um, like instrument that could do widespread dispersal. So why downtown Erie, Pennsylvania? So we sit in a really interesting spot as far as the migratory pattern of bats in this area. So we are their last stop where they will replenish um, food reserves before they take the journey over Lake Erie. And that has prompted us to do bat walks here on Gannon's campus. So every year here at Gannon University, we survey 65 to 70 sites Monday through Friday in search of bats. If we do find bats, we mark them with a non-toxic washable paint, and then we jot down in a notebook where they were based on the building, the direction they were in, how many there were in the species. We do this to see if they stay in the same roost every night or if they move to a potentially better roost. We don't handle bats because the Game Commission actually has very strict guidelines on handling bats, and you actually have to have a license to handle them. We don't want to handle them for multiple reasons, the first being that we don't want to disturb bats because we're usually looking for bats during the day and as they're nocturnal, they're usually sleeping at that time. We also don't want to risk contracting rabies because it's a very extensive treatment process and it's also a very deadly disease to have. We also don't want to risk transferring white nose syndrome from one bat to the next, so we just don't handle them. And then as you can see from the pictures here, this is the non-toxic washable paint that we, that we use. So our hypothesis is that the number of bats in the Erie area would decrease from the previous census due to the presence of white nose syndrome. Our data proved this to be correct, and we're beginning with data from 2012 because the previous 10 years of data have been pretty consistent up until this point. So the first graph is just the marked versus unmarked bats, and in 2012 we had a, a little over 1,200 bats. And then in 2013 we were all the way down to just 135 bats. This remained true until 2020, where we had about seven bats. And then in 2021, we had eight bats. And then in 2022, we actually only saw five bats. This graph here looks at the distribution of bat species. And in beginning in, or in 2012, we saw the majority of little brown bats at 94%. And then despite the significant decrease in the amount of bats we saw, we, saw, we still had the majority of the little brown at 90%. This remained true up until 2018, where we still saw the majority of little brown bats. However, we only had a total of six. And then in 2020, we uh, were back to the majority, uh, or I'm sorry, in 2020, we actually saw more big brown bats than little, ba little brown bats, which, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in 2020, we saw more big brown bats than little brown, and we only saw seven bats, so it wasn't very substantial evidence to determine if there was like a change in pattern. And then in 2021, we were back to having the majority of little brown bats. And then in 2022, we only saw five bats and we still had the majority of little brown. This graph here looks at the number of bats per day. And as you can see, we had a majority of peaks in the August, September range. And this is due to bats are ten tending to migrate around this time. And they're also looking for food. And they're also looking for a place to hibernate for the winter. And in 2013, despite the decrease in the amount of bats that we saw, we still saw those same peaks in the August, September months. And then this remained true all the way up until 2018, where we actually started to see bats earlier on in around the months of May and June, but still seeing bats in the August, September months. And then in 2020, we actually had an even distribution of bats as early as April all the way to September. And then it's the same for 2021. And then in 2022, we saw bats as early as April up until August. So this graph here looks at the bat distribution by building. Our most popular were East Old Main, North Old Main, East Palumbo Academic Center, and the East Communication of Arts Building. The East Communication of Arts Building is very popular because it faces away from the sun. And it's also tucked away from the sidewalk so the bats can roost up in by those window corners right there in the picture. And it's also, um, a, the building is made out of bricks, so it's a good gripping material for the bats to hang on to. 
East Palumbo Academic Center is very similar. It's facing away from the sun. It's extremely tucked away from the sidewalk, so there's less activity going on. And it's also made out of brick, so it's good for the bats to grip onto. Now, Old Main Front is very interesting because it has a cave-like appearance, and there's bars in the windows, which, as Sarah stated earlier, bats are very familiar with bars because bars have been built into caves so that people can't go past to where the bats are and pass on the white nose syndrome. So they're very familiar with flying behind these bars and roosting there. East Old Main is also very cave-like and it's extremely tucked away from any activity at all. There is a door down there, however, people don't really use it so there's not a lot of activity going on. And when it rains, this area fills up with water, which increases the insect population, which is a major food source for bats, so it's a very good spot for them. So in conclusion, our total bat findings have greatly decreased from the previous years. However, <coughs> bats are making a comeback, um, more specifically in Bucks County and Knox Mixon State Park, where they have reported seeing more bats than they have in previous years. And Michigan State University has also discovered that bats are beginning to be resistant to white nose syndrome. They've also saw that bats are becoming heavier, meaning that they, get, they have more fat so they can better fight off white nose syndrome. And bats are found roosting in alternative temperature sites than were previously observed. This um, correlates with the data where we were seeing bats in the earlier months because they're roosting in colder temperatures now. So our future plans are we int intend to continue the project during the 2023-2024 academic year while maintaining a bat-friendly campus, keeping people informed on what to do and who to talk to when they see a bat, and also building alternative roost sites, as you can see in the picture on the right. We'd like to thank Dr. Stephen Robski from the Gannon University Biology Department, who without him, this experiment would not be running, as well as the people listed below, because without them, we would not have been able to run this project for as long as we have and continue to do so. And this is our source page. Any questions? Um, I think that most of the bat species we see are pretty typical of the urban area, but we have a resident bat expert in here, so Dr. Rose, do you want to? No, I think you're right. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I like when the students answer the question. <laughs> no? Yes. No, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you. Go ahead. So I, I apologize if this is a stupid question, but uh, you were doing visual inspections of the buildings and not any acoustic or anything like that? Just Correct. We have done acoustic before a little bit, but that, that's not, like, we don't have that as part of this, but I think we've done that. Yeah, we actually did acoustic here at the Ridge Center when they had a small wind turbine, yeah. and we set up an anabat and they recorded to see who flew by and who got killed, but we haven't done acoustic stuff there, so we should talk about acoustic stuff. <laughs> okay. So you talk a lot about like migration pathways and that. So these bats are all just transitioning through in migration, or some of them are resident. Are they? I mean, are they ending up hibernation or around here somewhere? Do we know anything about that? I think they're mostly like they end up um, in Canada. I think we're, we're pretty much just a stopping ground, replenish, uh, you know, fat reserves, and then get across Lake Erie. Do you have a question? Wait, so you didn't handle the bats, but you, you marked them? We marked them, yeah. So we, like, basically, we have, like, gardening gloves, get up on a ladder, and then, like, we have a little tiny paintbrush and put the little dog paint on. We're pretty careful. Um, I've never had one wake up on me. I've only ever had one, like, kind of peel its head back a little bit. Like, it could... It was a little uncomfortable, you know, it was waking up a little bit, but I've never had one like awake awake. <laughs> but yeah. Um, we only ever we only ever hold them if it's like absolutely necessary and when we do that Dr. Rusty always handles them. Uh, we we don't handle them at all.
one more presentation in this setting, in this the session. Um, we have Cassandra Froelich with When a Duck Nests on Your Green Roof, again. <laughs> I was just testing to make sure I know how to use the clicker. Very important tool. All right, but yes, as you heard, when a duck nests on your green roof again. So my name is Cassandra Frolish. I'm a pre-vet uh, biology student at Gannon University. And over the past two summers, we've got um, the privilege of working with Dr. Stephen Robski on top of our Nash Library green roof. So for those who missed our 2021 presentation here, I'm just going to do a quick recap of what exactly happened with this duck in 2021 and what has happened in 2022. So let's start with 2021. So from June 3rd to June 20th is when we got to observe Little Miss Willie as we ended up <laughs> naming her in a very nice way. Uh, but she is actually a mallard duck. So as you can see, she is on top of Nash Library which is, um, we have a green roof up there and it's three stories in the air and completely surrounded by windows, no water. Whoop. Awesome. My apologies to everyone. Um, but no water, no hiding area really other than those little sedum bushes that you see there. Um, so this made her a really interesting specimen as far as behavioral research. and. I didn't know that I was actually going to get to do research on her. I started off looking at the Erie Zoo, but it was during COVID and they weren't taking anyone to, do, to actually do any sort of behavioral research. And Dr. Ofsky was up on top of Nash, just weeding, and he was essentially over top of Willie when he decided, oh, there's a duck there, I should probably leave and get a hold of Casey. This will be a perfect research opportunity. And I think I really did a number on the clip. <laughs> Okay, we're just gonna resort to this. So, we jumped right into our observational strategies, which was obviously the researcher presence, which would have been just Dr. Robski and myself. Dr. Robski would have been there in the morning or any day that I couldn't be there, and then I would hop in around the afternoon and we would each be there for a couple hours at a time, just watching every little movement that Willie was making, because we were in a race against time at this point. We didn't know if she had eggs, when they were gonna hatch, we had to make sure that we were on top of everything that she was doing. Um, because we knew that at some point, nature might take its course, and we didn't want that to happen if these ducklings did hatch. So in order to also have eyes on her at all times, we started using cameras. So that was uh, first our GoPro, then our CASA home surveillance camera. Mind you, neither of these ended up working. Always stick with the simple stuff, which is when we got to our Reconyx trail cams. This is what they're made for. So we immediately got these out on the roof on June 11th, um, and they remained on the roof for eight days. And we really wanted to see if she was making any movement off of the roof, which would tell us if she was fully brooding or not. Brooding is just when she is incubating the eggs at all times. She's not really taking care of herself, and all of her focus is gonna be on those eggs. And as it says here, much movement, but no mallard. We had about 200 pictures of pigeons on here. Um, not what we were looking for, but it gave us the information we needed to know that she was fully brooding. And on top of these observations, we also had a big Gannon community effort from the library staff. Um, and they started their observations June 9th, and they would do them every hour, starting at 8.30 in the morning until 5.30 at night. And it was amazing because they would tell us where she was facing and if there was any patterns due to what time of day it was, and if she was facing a certain way, there wasn't a pattern. She's a very stubborn duck, <laughs> as we'll see later on. But one of our first and most important uh, sightings that we had was the initial egg sighting, which was a little earlier on, June 4th. So that was the day after we got our camera set up, um, and that let us know that we had to, again, keep a really close eye on her. And then not only were we looking for eggs, we were looking at her behaviors, like I stated before. So this is a behavior that for a long time we called chattering. Um, and there's also a much slower version of this that we called panting, which is actually correct. However, the chattering behavior we found out is actually called vocalization. 
And what this does is it allows her to communicate with her young, and when it is time for them to hatch, <laughs> Um, they will also vocalize back to her and vocalize amongst themselves, which will allow them to synchronize when each one of them will hatch. Not all of them hatch at the same time. They hatch one at a time, and it'll take a full 24-hour day in most cases. So, like it says here, we had an unexpected hatching, which, like I said before, they, we hadn't seen her leave the nest, and we didn't know whether it was going to be 16 days before the eggs hatched or if it was going to be 20 days before the eggs hatched. But on June 20th, which ironically was Father's Day, <laughs> Dr. Robeski took a trip to Nash Library in between spending time with his family and saw that we had a present waiting for us. So that present came in the form of five hatched ducklings. That would also mean that we had unhatched eggs left over, and I'll talk about those a little bit later on. Uh, but we immediately jumped on this and we got a hold of WIN, which is Wildlife in Need. They're an emergency rescue service. And they would end up coming out uh, the next day. And this post that you see here is actually a fence post that they were going to try and set up and put a net around her. Um, and while they're trying to set up a fence, Dr. Ropsky and myself have actually ran down all three, three or four flights of stairs and are standing where all the cement is at at the very bottom and we have two makeshift parachutes. Luckily, we don't have to use parachutes, as you'll be able to tell here right now. <laughs> they were able to get Willie and all five of the ducklings using a net, um, and she's not very happy about that. So what they actually have to do, which I can show you here on this next slide, is that they actually have to split these guys up. They'll put Willie in a large crate, and then they'll put the ducklings in another smaller crate. That's just so that we avoid Willie injuring herself or injuring one of the ducklings. And then this is some very important clips from another video that I had to take out due to the length of it. But in the upper left hand corner, you can see our wildlife and need expert kind of like fully head in the nest. And what she's doing is she's listening to these eggs to see if they are vocalizing anymore or if there's any heat coming from them. And at this point, no, there is no chirping, no chattering, and no warmth. But despite that, they still went ahead and put all of the additional eggs into a little travel box with the nesting material as well, just to give Willie the chance to incubate these eggs further at the rehabilitation site. And something awesome that happens with this, it might not sound awesome initially, but it is, Something awesome that happens with these eggs later on while she's at the rehabilitation site is that they do not hatch. There is no developing offspring in these eggs. So Willie has to take it upon herself to make sure that the energy she put into those eggs is taken back into herself. So what she does is she actually smashes these eggs and she eats them. And that is just how that cycle works. So. Finally to safety, and this is where we're getting them ready to go off to that rehabilitation site. And we were all so relieved, so happy. I was sweating through my clothes. <laughs> and finally, on August 31st, they would be released into Union City. And as you can see here, the ducklings, there are six of them in this picture. One is actually an orphaned duckling that ended up growing up with our original five. And the reason that you don't see Willie in this picture is because she actually, like I've stated before, she's a stubborn girl. She figured out how to escape while the ducklings were old enough to be okay without her. <laughs> and um, that was when they were in Northeast, and, that, and then these guys were driven to Union City when they were old enough to live amongst other ducks on a farm, actually. So that's where they are still at to this day. So then at the end of last year, we asked the question, Will this happen again? Will Willie want to deal with us again? Well, the sightings begin again. And we actually got a email from someone that worked in the library. And they said, is this your duck? <laughs> We're like, no, that's not our duck. But our duck is probably coming back. So this male mallard, as it says on there, was spotted April 11, 2022. So a little bit earlier than our last nesting adventure and nine days later wouldn't you know it 
Miss Willie, the mother mallard, has returned on the 20th. And immediately again, we're like, oh no, we better start moving because you can't move fast enough when it comes to wildlife research. So we immediately started with the Reconyx camera because we didn't want to mess with GoPro and we didn't want to mess with home surveillance systems. It just takes too long. So we immediately got those set out on the roof the day after we knew that she was there. And I scanned personally through the footage every week. It came straight to my laptop. And then we also added on some additional student researchers. Um, two of them actually went right before me and they were a great help. They had scheduled observational periods and they updated us daily with their one to two hour observations. And something that's interesting about what they saw is that Willie was a lot less active this year. And I couldn't, I couldn't figure out why. I was like, maybe we just caught her earlier on than we expected to, but I think it has something to do with potential experimental error. Um, so, as you can see, there are two City of Erie police officers on top of our roof here. And this top one, they're actually walking over her nest. I don't even think that they knew she was actually there. So she may have been a little bit more stressed out because we weren't seeing so much of that vocalization. We weren't seeing so much of the head popping up when we came by. She was very not happy with anyone <laughs> at this point in time. And this was a little later on, so May 7th. Um, and they were actually looking for a suspect, <laughs> and they found a duck, not exactly what they were looking for. And they luckily did not move our cameras, that's another thing that's important to note, but their boots were pretty close to kicking them over. <laughs> um, and then, on May 16th, after watching her, not really getting any feedback from her, we thought we were seeing either egg-laying behavior, or Maybe on the off chance it was a hatching behavior. Always expect the unexpected, needless to say. So she um, began to point her tail up and she would actually flick it, almost like she was trying to push something out. Complete opposite. They were already out. <laughs> and again, we didn't expect this to happen, but we went from five ducklings the first time to 12. So she put a lot of energy into these guys. Every single one of her eggs was able to hatch this time. Probably why she didn't want to talk to us all that much. But this was the day after we started to notice that tail flicking behavior. And this time was a little more difficult because we called Wynn right away and talked to Sue, same as 2021. And she wasn't able to come herself because they didn't have any emergency vehicles ready for us. Um, but what they did do is they sent the game commission and two game wardens to us who were absolutely wonderful and you'll see lots of <laughs> fun pictures from them. So it started off great. They went ahead and they got all of the ducklings almost single file into this crate. They just kind of scooted their little behinds right on into there. And then not so easy. <laughs> Willie stood by and watched as they single file went into their crate. And then as they turned around to, to try and also get her into the crate, she decided it would be a good time to take several trips around Nash Library and fly on top of the roof and make the capture process really quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I could get the video to upload, but these are uh, snapshots from the capture process. So Willie got smarter as the year went on, apparently, but he actually went up to grab her. He, was, he wasn't tall enough, didn't jump up quick enough, so he was a little defeated at that point. Um, but we immediately made other plans, and as she got closer to the window and kind of looked in at us, like, what in the world is going on? They went ahead and tried to use a blanket to catch her, and as you can see, her wing is coming out of that frame of view, and she actually hopped right into the other game warden's lap. And they were awesome sports about it, and they actually came inside, and there were other students who were watching and wanted to learn, so Dr. Opsky and myself got to talk to students about why this is kind of an anomaly, and why green roofs are so important in the first place, and then also where ducks should normally be. And what we did here is we actually got the opportunity to release them closer to the bayfront, 
And then Dr. Robesky and myself actually escorted them <laughs> as close as we could till they got to a place where they were comfortable and could reach water, which was something that our green roof unfortunately could not offer at the time. So something to take away from this entire presentation is not to only ask ourselves how the world around us is adapting to us, but how can we adapt to them? How can we help animals like Willie or help birds like Willie live with us? So we are looking into other green roofs and other green roof research and how can we diversify them in order to really help these guys, like I said, live with us and help us adapt to them. So Willie is a great story and this next time we actually will have to remove her from the roof just because we haven't adapted to her. But in the future we would like to make more green roofs that are wildly adapted. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions or if there's time for questions. <laughs> So what um, kind of mitigation would you do to create green roofs so that you wouldn't have to remove her or other wildlife? One of the biggest things that I've been thinking about since 2021 was adding some sort of water source that is not too deep because of course what's on that green roof already are, are shallow pans. So we would want a shallow water source, maybe potentially something that could be supplemented by rainwater. And then also, since a lot of people know about what has happened on top of their green roof, is to add some sort of netting that can just help her get off of the side of the building. So just some sort of netting with small holes in it to help them essentially get off of the roof. Um, and then if we were able to do that at some point, it would also help us with our other green roofs because I, you're, are you, you're not from this part of PA, right? Because I was going to mention Erie Insurance and all that stuff. I didn't think so, but Erie Insurance has an awesome green roof. Um, you also have Asbury Woods. They have a super, super awesome and diverse green roof. Um, so all of these places, if we're able to adapt ours, they may be able to adapt theirs. And these are simple things. This is maybe a water pan with a little drain or a filter in it and netting. So it's not like the first adaptations have to be expensive. So that's kind of what we would be thinking about. Are there other instances across the country of people with green roofs with ducks on them and what they've done about them? <laughs> not this talked about. I honestly haven't seen anything. Um, the only abnormal thing that we heard about that was somewhat close was geese nesting on top of telephone poles. I think, but in nothing that is related to a green roof that has been observed to this extent. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. So you and I have had this discussion. Yes. If Willie starts to build a nest, should we start taking the nest apart so she doesn't use that site again? I know we have different views on this. Go ahead. I think it's a good idea just because of emergency resources being kind of scarce, especially this last time, I was really nervous because we thought that we were going to have to put a pool together with dandelions. I'm sorry, I was trying to see if I could get that for you. Um, but we were gonna try and see if we could get a pool together with dandelions. I mean, we were going through every option and I just got so nervous for the babies that I was like, no! We can't let them do it again. As much as I love seeing her, I can't. I don't want to see little splats. I don't. <laughs> but if we could add netting and a water source, I think it would be a good idea because she did figure out that she can go under the fence of the green roof. She just couldn't bring them with her on the way down. So. <laughs> All right, that brings us to the end of this session. Um, we will now have a break until the next session begins at 2 o'clock.
Okay, uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Jen Salem. I'm the Regional Science Consortium Plant Lab Manager. And um, just a quick announcement, if you were kind enough to say that you are going to judge our student presenter in this uh, session, it's a speed talk, so it doesn't get judged. So put your pencils down, you don't need to do that. Um, and uh, first we have uh, Dr. Mike Campbell from Mercyhurst, and he is going to be speaking on, oh boy, I'm gonna let you do awesome. that title. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Preliminary comparative analysis of soil microarthropod communities of tamarack, swamp, and bog Warren County, Pennsylvania. And that's a photograph that I had to tamper down its resolution because it was like 15 megabytes. In it. <laughs> but what a gorgeous bog that I've never been to until uh, a little over a month ago. And did I just hit one of these buttons to make it advance? OK, the, probably the arrow to the right. The right. right. OK, all right. Oh, wait. I think, it's back. I think it got dropped and broken last session. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll just use the keyboard. <laughs> okay, here we go. If, if you've never been to Tamarack Swamp, it's not quite an hour away from Erie. If you go through Union City or past Union City on Route 6 to Columbus, uh, which puts you in Warren County, just over the Erie County line, uh, it's a state game land. Uh, I think it's number 197 that's north of Columbus. And when I tell people that I went to Columbus over the weekend, you know, they say, oh, you went to Ohio. No, it's Columbus, Pennsylvania, which is a little tiny town. And uh, I'd only been there once before, and it was to visit with Shane Hochlander. If any of you remember Shane, who was a Pennsylvania Game Commission land manager here in Erie County. Uh, and, and he lives nearby. And I did not know until I went there and began looking into whether or not others had ever studied uh, biological entities at this location, but Tamarack Swamp is a national natural landmark. And it is in part because of the, uh, the, the nicely protected nature of it. Most of it is, is on Pennsylvania game lands and the portions of it that are not on the game land that have interesting natural resources are also not under any threat of being developed. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about it, uh, you can check out the uh, National Natural Landmarks uh, entry on this site. I have been interested since I arrived in Erie in the early 1980s in its glacial history, uh, in part because I grew up in central Pennsylvania and in an area of Pennsylvania that had not been directly affected by the Wisconsin period of glaciation, which uh, affected our area between 22 and 14,000 years ago with massive ice sheets that came down here from the north and covered uh, much of uh, what is now northwestern Pennsylvania and western New York State, and you can kind of see the uh, southernmost extent of the ice sheets during the Wisconsin period were right about the New York State line over in Warren County, and that's close to where this site is. And uh, this is just a diagram from an article that was talking about the nature of the of the glacial advances and. The fascinating thing about glacial features is they're often shaped by what happened when the ice stopped advancing and began to just stall there and churn and melt at the edges and dump things off onto the landscape. And it left behind a lot of interesting features along the front of the ice, including some of our kettle lakes and interesting little rises in the landscape that are glacial moraines. And uh, it, it has contributed to uh, the fact that we have a lot of wetlands in northwestern Pennsylvania, a lot more than areas further south. And besides the wetlands, we have lakes that are natural kettle lakes, like Lake Pleasant and Edinburgh Lake. And Edinburgh Lake, or did I say that? Uh, Lake LaBeouf, I meant to say, in, in Waterford, and others. And uh, this is what uh, a Google Earth image recently 
snagged from Google Earth, looks like, of the, the game land. And I put red rectangles here around the two areas where I did my field sampling to uh, investigate the soil microarthropod communities. Uh, I have never in my career done any research on soil microarthropods because I'm primarily an aquatic biologist and most of my research in the past has been focused on benthic macroinvertebrates of streams or plankton in, in lakes in Presque Isle Bay. But uh, I got saddled with teaching a soils class this semester and I'm, I'm close to retirement so I was a bit hesitant about taking on a soils class because I've never had a soils class myself but I figured I knew enough about soils from the dozen or so ecology type courses I've taught throughout my career and, and decided to jump into it and discovered uh, a group of organisms that I only vaguely knew existed until recently and are just as interesting, if not more interesting, than some of the things I've invested many years of my career studying. So, you know, maybe I'll stick with this now and continue to do soils <laughs> research. But uh, the first rectangle at the upper part of the swamp was the first glimpse I had of the environment. And you had to drive a mile or so on a really bumpy, gravel road to get to this site, uh, which is on Alder Bottom Road. And uh, Alder Bottom Road had a blockade up, so I had to kind of walk across from that Y intersection to get to where the swamp uh, went underneath the, the road on a bridge that was pretty much completely fallen apart. I, I can't imagine even the Game Commission people being daredevil enough to drive over it. but. Uh, I was interested initially in, in looking at soil microarthropod communities in forested habitats, in what was inhabiting the litter layer of the soil. And uh, I spotted this little clump of trees and shrubs and ferns that were right close to the edge of the, the meandering tributary that, uh, that enters the swamp from the north and uh, took my first sample near the base of, uh, of a pine tree there. And uh, this is what the, the surface litter looked like. I won't be showing you images like this for all of the various locations I sampled, but just to give you an idea of my methodology, at each site, and there were six altogether where I collected litter material from the soil surface, I, uh, I collected uh, an area of, of about 1,000 square centimeters, which is about a square foot. And I just scraped with my hands to a depth of about an inch and put that in a Ziploc bag and, and then carried that back to my car and, uh, and followed a similar procedure for all of the other five locations. Uh, between the, the first site that, it was, that was at the upper end of the swamp and the bog itself, where I did most of my collecting, I, I traveled through a, a fairly large uh, cattle ranch, I guess. There's a, a farmer out there who grows a special breed of, of beef that uh, I, I talked to the guy for 45 minutes. These, these beef cows are genetically programmed to produce beef that's very low in cholesterol. And, also very lean and uh, apparently really tender. And uh, uh, I, I was ready to buy a side of beef from the guy, especially after he told me I'd be able to walk through his pasture to get to the bog, you know, because you couldn't get to the bog easily unless you were able to make your way through the swamp, which I wasn't, I'm too old to do that anymore. So I talked to a farmer for 45 minutes and he gave me permission to walk through his pasture. So. I made friends with some of these cows. <laughs> that was a bonus. Uh, so the lower rectangle there shows the area of the bog that I spent a couple hours moving around to try to get samples of surface litter of soil to represent different vegetation types because I was curious to see whether or not the, the nature of the overlying vegetation and the quality of the litter at the floor underneath the vegetation had any relationship to the kinds of microarthropods that lived in the, uh, in the litter. 
which is sort of the hot spot, that de decomposing plant material at the surface layer of the soil is where most of the action is with respect to invertebrates that live in soil. So I defined five specific vegetation types as I wandered around the edge of the bog. And this is one of those bogs where when you stand on the sphagnum mat and jump up and down, the whole thing shakes. So they're really neat. And I didn't take photographs of them, but there were, uh, there were thousands of pitcher plants that were in this bog environment. And many of them had sort of the remnants of their flowers from earlier in the season. And uh, it was, it was I, I took a lot of pictures while I was out there. And I wish I could have used more of them here. But I defined the sphagnum mat itself, which was out at the edge of the water as one of the zones. And then leather leaf, which is a, a sort of a, a low uh, emergent uh, sort of woody plant that, uh, that has an extensive development on top of the sphagnum. And then further back away from the leather leaf, and sphagnum mat, uh, there was a zone of cinnamon fern mixed with white pine. And then behind that, closer to the upland edge, there was a red uh, eastern hemlock dominated ecotone that I called a, a moat because there seemed to be little pools uh, of standing water associated with the eastern hemlock. And then the upland slope uh, beyond that was uh, red maple and black cherry dominated along with a lot of upland type ferns. Uh, so this was uh, the specific locations numbered from two to six for the sphagnum, leather leaf, cinnamon fern, eastern hemlock, and then the red maple uh, fern upland slope. And uh, I was amazed at the, the color. You know, in early October, uh, there had already been enough fading of the cinnamon fern that there was a, a really appealing sort of orangey tone to, the, uh, to that, that part of the zonation around the bog mat where the cinnamon fern was dominant. And uh, this line was my attempt to kind of mark a boundary to the actual wet area uh, that surrounded the, the open part of the bog. If I would have had a plankton net, I would have taken a plankton sample too because the, the kinds of algae you find in a habitat like that is usually very distinctive because the water is, is very acidic. The sphagnum secretes hydrogen ion into solution and it acidifies the water. And it's one of the reasons why plant material doesn't decompose because it's too acidic for most of the decomposing bacteria to, to do anything. So, these habitats develop the way they do in part because of the effect of the sphagnum in acidifying the environment. A uh, photograph in the upper left is what the sphagnum looked like where I took my, my surface litter sample and then the leather leaf uh, lower left. Uh, this was my actual path. Uh, I confess I was bird watching while doing this using eBird and my app on eBird gives me a precise map of uh, pretty much every step I took. So you can kind of see the places where I'm backtracking and circling around where the areas where I pause to take pictures and collect litter samples. New application for my eBird app on my cell phone, which is pretty cool for tracking my movements. And I actually got lost. I, I got turned around when I came out of the bog because I really didn't keep track how far I had walked around the perimeter. And I actually started going in the completely wrong direction, and it took me about 45 minutes to get straightened out and make my way back to the cow pasture. But I did find my way back out. Uh, this is what the eastern hemlock moat looked like, and uh, this is what the slope with the black cherry and red maple and ferns looked like, where I took samples in a very similar way to what I had shown you in that early photograph. Uh, each of those samples I suspended in a Burley's funnel uh, in the laboratory and uh, left them go for five days with a 40 watt light bulb shining down on them. And what uh, Burley's funnel does is it, it makes the, uh, all of the living creatures to make their way as deep as they can and then drop into a little jar of 70% ethanol where then you can then after five days see what you've got. Uh, and I did my best to identify things, at least classify them. I, I'm not an expert 
on these, and so I, the best I could do was kind of classify the mites into different major types, and uh, I could recognize the difference between a mite and a pseudoscorpion anyways, but uh, this is what the samples look like when you take what's in your jar and dump it into a Petri dish. Uh, most of the critters are so tiny that you need to have a dissecting microscope to identify what they are. Uh, the, the most common species, as in this photograph, which isn't mine, included mites. Uh, these are both examples of orobatid mites, which are very common in litter samples from forests, soils, all over the world. Uh, also springtails, which are a type of insect, and this looks like a, a millipede. Uh, I didn't get a lot of crustaceans like millipedes, but uh, that is a pretty good representation of what the samples look like. And there were hundreds, if not thousands, of individual specimens in each one of the samples. So it was a bit overwhelming, not already having any specific knowledge about how to identify these. But this is a screenshot from my spreadsheet that kind of gives the totals uh, for orobatid mites in the six samples and the Leatherleaf zone and the eastern hemlock moat came out on top with the highest densities of, of orobatted mites. Springtails were also abundant in the same two locations, so whatever makes these litters at, in those two zones attractive to orobatted mites also seems to entertain the, the springtails pretty well. Uh, and then numbers of other kinds of mites, uh, mesostigmatid and prostigmatid mites, which have distinctively different mouth parts and, and anterior appendages, so you can kind of at least classify them to a family level. Uh, some spiders, uh, insect larvae, uh, a few adult insects, and pseudoscorpions, which were the most exciting ones as far as I'm concerned. If you've ever seen a pseudoscorpion, they, they look like little miniature versions of the scorpions that are really scary looking. And I imagine they are scary looking to an orobatid mite because that's their predators on some of the other more abundant, smaller arthropods. Uh, so here's bar graphs to kind of represent the same results which would have been discernible in the table. Uh, again, the orobatid mites and springtails were the most abundant ones in the, the two zones that, uh, that are identified there in the leather leaf and in the eastern hemlock moat. Uh, insects, uh, besides springtails, in case you're curious, I was able to classify to order anyways the insects, and uh, there were beetles and uh, just one caddisfly specimen that was one with a case, which I think I will be able to identify further, uh, some uh, moth larvae, uh, some thrips, uh, a few ants, which ended up being only in the upland one and also some bugs that were primarily represented in the more upland one of the red maple forest. Uh, so an interesting variety of insects. Uh, and then this is just a, uh, a kind of a 2D, 3D graph to kind of represent the, uh, the different types of mites and the, the spiders, which uh, were exciting to, to see, although they weren't very numerous. And uh, I want to give credit to my friend Jim Bukovich, who came today. I handed off to him six vials with all of my spiders on Sunday morning, and I'm, I'm hoping to get some uh, idea of whether or not any of the spiders there are interesting. Uh, I've read papers published about microarthropods in bogs, and apparently they find really unusual species there, sometimes that haven't been known to occur in other wet kinds of habitats because those acidic soils uh, kind of present a unique setting. Uh, my plan for, for moving past uh, the stage I'm at now with this work, which I consider preliminary, is to maybe get a, a friend and colleague who does molecular biology work to maybe uh, hand off my samples uh, to see if we can use some genomic methods to get IDs, because I'm pretty sure I probably have a couple dozen different species of the orobatid mites in particular, and uh, I've tried to look at what the quality of taxonomic keys are for keying these out, and I think I'm maybe a little too old to wade into that water yet. So, but I, I do think it could be interesting for 
uh, some meta barcoding type analysis. And I've learned that soil scientists all around the world have come to the same realization I have, that there is an incredible diversity of creatures in this environment that we little appreciate. And the soils are so important, and the functions of these microarthropods in the soils are equally important. Uh, and, and we should come to appreciate more about the biodiversity of this group. And that is all I have to share. Yes. <laughs> it could be any or all of the above. You know, I think in some cases the the very really high numbers of some of the orbited mites might be attributed to lower numbers of some of their predators. I have a feeling there's biotic interactions that could be important, but certainly the quality of the litter, which depends upon the kinds of plants that are dropping the leaves, would be important too. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Kirk. You're welcome. Okay. Moving on, we have Haley Ludington. Ludington? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's get you set up here. And if you want to introduce your to Haley. And I don't know if you've heard, but our, it's not working, sorry. <laughs> As, as introduced, my name is Haley. I'm with the University of Pittsburgh at Bradford, um, and today I'm here to talk about uh, brachyurins from the Upper Kimmeridgian sponge reefs of southern Germany. Um, and brachyurins just refers to an infra order of uh, crabs. So basically, I'm here to talk about fossil crabs. Uh, so just for the location, um, I included a couple maps of where Geisingen, Germany is. Um, like I said, it's in the southern portion of Germany. Um, and then another few pictures of the location, uh, just to kind of describe the rock formations that we were looking at. Um, it's Upper Kimmeridgian limestone, which is part of the Jurassic uh, era. And the um, historical ge geological site was sponge reefs. Um, and the actual collection was just under that red arrow on the top of those uh, rock formations. So um, I'm in the early por portion of my project because it's a two semester project and this is my first semester of it. Um, so some of the preliminary groupings that I have, I have 44 samples in total of fossil crabs um, and I have five groups, which I just added one as of like this past week. So it's still progressing forward pretty rapidly. Um, but my five groupings are based on the carapace size, which just refers to uh, the general shape of the crab. Um, so I have semi-round carapaces, which are seen on the bottom left. Um, and it's really hard to see these specimens because they are so small. But um, I also have rectangular carapaces, which they are longer rather than wider. Um, Semi-square carapace, there's only two samples of those. So those are in the top um, left. Uh, lost lobster or shrimp fossils, which obviously are not brachyurans, but they are decapods, they are still crustaceans. Um, and then I have a category for other because these fossils I haven't had a chance to really get to clean yet, so I need to reveal more of the, the specimen in order to make those determinations. Um, and then, like I said, these fossils are very small in size, uh, and these are kind of just scale photos. Um, so the entire fossil is encircled in this Sharpie marker right here, um, and I have a dime for scale to show you because this fossil is just that. So I do have to work with a microscope in order to see these, these specimens and in order to see more of the defining characteristics um, in order to help me identify them. Uh, and this is a picture of my workstation. Uh, so I have the microscope there and all my specimens are laid out, spread all over the place, all over the lab. Um, so what I'm doing for my project, I'm observing the specimens under a stereo microscope, which is pictured there. Um, and then I, after an, an initial observation, I separate. I have separated them into those preliminary groupings based on the carapace morphology, which again just refers to the overall shape um, of the fossil. And then after that, I'm going through and I'm using 
air abrasive tool to uh, kind of chip away at the rock surrounding the fossil in order to reveal more of the specimen from the rock in order to make more accurate descriptions of the fossils. Um, and after all of that, I go through and I make a description of the fossil, which is kind of a long process because there's so much that you can describe in order to make the accurate um, description of the fossils to get them with the correct species that they belong in. And in order to do that, I'm comparing my descriptions with descriptions from other um, published work. And then that is all I have so far because I, like I said, I am in the early portions of my project. Um, and I'd just like to thank all the people listed and you guys for uh, attendance today. I appreciate it. Thank you. And we do have time for a question or two if anyone had anything for Haley. How much of the crab is preserved? Is it just the carapace or can you see? Um, so sometimes you have the rostrum, which is like a type of antenna that sticks out from the top, but I haven't seen any of the legs yet. Um, it's just been the carapace. Has anybody studied this particular fauna before that gives you a place to start with preliminary types of things that could be there? So actually my advisor who is um, overseeing my uh, capstone, his PhD dissertation was on um, fossil crabs, brachyurans. So I have a lot of um, help from him in describing and cleaning and everything like that. He actually collected the samples. So. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, yeah, it's been <laughs> very helpful. <laughs> well, if there's no other questions, then thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Magdalene uh, Baum from Allegheny College, and I'm going to switch this over. senior currently at Allegheny College, and like every senior, I have to conduct a senior research project, which is why I've chosen to focus on the impact of human activity levels on coyote temporal behavior on Presque Isle State Park. So just for a basic overview, a Presque Isle State Park is a very popular state park for humans for various reasons. We have beaches, um, biking and hiking trails, etc., and there are tons of wildlife on the island as well, including coyotes. Now, coyotes are not particularly fond of humans, so they are known to spatially distance themselves from humans to avoid any kind of ne negative interaction. But there are also studies that support that coyotes will temporally or change when, what times of the day they are active to avoid humans as well. Since humans are active during the day, that means they become more nocturnal. So I am looking, I want to study um, when, what kind of temporal behaviors coyotes exhibit on Presque Isle, and I plan to do that using camera traps and photo analysis. So this is very important um, in, in terms of human wildlife land sharing. As human infrastructure and development expands, there are more areas that human wildlife habitats overlap, especially in areas like Prescott, so state parks, national parks, national forests, et cetera. And learning more about coyotes and other wildlife behaviors is important in learning how to coexist with them. Other benefits of doing this kind of study is that we can learn more about the ecology of coyotes, um, again, their behaviors, how they interact with their environment around them. The results can also be used for um, teaching visitors to Presque Isle more about coyotes, um, how to avoid those negative interactions, and also can be used to inform future management plans put into place. So again, my general question is, does human activity and their presence affect when coyotes are active on Presque Isle? So first I had to choose my study sites and I want to have an area of high human activity, low human activity, and area without human activity. So to do that I looked, um, I wanted to have my camera set up on hiking trails, so I looked on websites like All Trails and Hiking Trails to look at the popularity of, um, of those hiking trails uh, out of five stars. I also looked at the proximity of these areas um, to things like beaches, um, 
playgrounds, shelters, bathrooms, areas where humans tend to be a lot. So on the very far left, I have the old gas well trail site. That is my area of high human activity. Um, on those websites, that trail was work rated four out of five stars, and it is very close to beach seven and eight. Um, pavilions, shelters, playgrounds, etc. Inter Basically, there's a lot of human activity around it. My area of lower human activity is the intersection of March, Marsh and Ridge Trails. They themselves do not have ratings, but Marsh Trail comes off of Sidewalk Trail, which is highly rated. It is four out of five stars again. And the trails are well maintained. Um, and besides that, there is the road that generally goes around Pascal close by as well. So still human activity, simply not as much. And then my natural area is off of Dead Pond Trail. That does have a decently high rating of set of 3.7 out of 5 stars. However, the, trail, the site I chose is actually off of the trail. You can't see the trail from the site and vice versa. There's also been signs of recent beaver activity and other animal tracks in the site, therefore why I've chosen it as my natural area. At the sites themselves, I plan on having two cameras up at, at each site, and I'll be, I'm putting those cameras up actually throughout this week of October 30th, and I plan to take them down during the week of January 30th. So I'll be collecting about three months worth of data. During this time, I'll be going up every two weeks, making sure those cameras are still okay, the battery level's all right, and I'll be switching out SD cards as well. Um, and these cameras have a lot of different settings, but the most important ones are that I'm having a 30 second delay um, in terms of when motion is first detected on these cameras, as well as taking photos in bursts of three. I'll also be defining individual detections of um, individuals by 30 minutes. So once I take these SD cards out of these cameras, I'll be bringing them back to campus, and I'll be uploading them onto my computer, backing it up onto an external hard drive, but then organizing all of those photos into a spreadsheet. And I'll be looking, I'll be documenting things such as the camera ID, the photo number, etc. But the most important three things I'll be documenting are the study sites, the time of the photo, slash time of day that the photos were taken, as well as the behaviors observed. So again, my study sites are the old Gaswell Trail, the intersection of Martian Bridge, and off of the Dead Pond, in the area off of the Dead Pond Trail. Um, next, I'll be looking at the time of the photo, so the actual physical time, which is usually taken in military time, and then the time of day, which I have into four different, have in four different categories, dusk, dawn, daytime, and nighttime. I do not have set hours for these yet, as uh, we are changing when the sun comes up and the setting is changing constantly right now, so I'll have to go back and define those um, times myself when I go through the photos. As for behaviors, I have active in the area, which can be seen on my left photo. This coyote is in the, in the set of photos, in the three, apologies, and the burst of three photos that this coyote was taken of. Um, the coyote is in the area, sniffing around, not moving through, simply just in the area of observing and exploring it. Um, active passing through is seen in the photo on the right. This coyote is passing through, seen very briefly in the burst of photos, um, obviously on a mission to get somewhere. And then my third behavior category is inactive slash at rest. This would mean maybe the coyote is napping, not doing much in the area. So once I have all my data and I have all of it organized, I will then sort all my, de my coyote detections first into the study sites, then within the study sites into the time of day, again, d dawn, dusk, daytime, and nighttime, and then from within those categories, the three behavior behaviors that I have. And then I can tally up the numbers for each of those um, categories and compare those numbers. So for my anticipated outcomes, again, based on pre previous studies, is that coyotes have become so habituated to humans that they have no reason, or they see no reason to try and avoid them temporally interactive throughout the day. The fourth unfortunate option would be getting no coyotes on camera. However, I am currently communicating with people working in Prescott State Park as they do have their own camera traps and coyotes, and they have, and they have caught coyotes in the Pennsylvania DCNR for uh, approving my permits and allowing me use of the state park land. And of course, thank you to my college, especially the Senior Comp Fund and the Urshka Fund. And these are my references. <laughs> I am very fond of the carnivore species, especially the gray wolf. Unfortunately, we do not have gray wolves in this area, but coyotes are pretty close. And I do not know much about them, and I think this is a good way to start learning about them. In the back.
back first. Um, I was wondering like, what considerations there might be since so you're separating like areas of high, low, and no human traffic, but I don't know what considerations there might be that for, for example, an individual animal's territory might lap into areas of different levels of human activity that could affect their So asking if like the range So that's definitely possible um, in general because of the size of Prescott State Park and coyote ranges are pretty big. Sorry, I can't think of the top of it off the top of my head. But I don't think that these different scenarios will have that big of a difference. And it, just because of how big their home range is, I'm considering Prescott to be the entirety of their home range, and so they'll be traveling around and such. Does that answer your question? You had a question as well? Great, great job. So, uh, do you consider seasonal effect on their behavior? Basically? Yes. And what is the future direction of this look? So, the seasonal effect, as in like the winter months, humans not being as present on the island. Yeah. yeah so, Presque Isle is known for its beaches, its water activities, etc. But there are still hiking trails um, in hiking trails that are available during the winter. Um, I, I'm hoping cross-country skiing and um, snowshoeing are activities that people like to participate in, especially when the snow, the Lake Erie snow comes in. Um, that is definitely something I have to consider when drawing my when I'm finished, when I've gone through my results and I'm drawing my conclusions for sure. Um, but as for the future of this project, um, this is just preliminary, something I'm interested in. Um, it can definitely be expanded on, especially if I don't get that many detections. Um, I know that Prescott already Start, already has coyotes on camera, so this is just building on that and starting to draw conclusions from what I'm seeing. That yeah, can definitely be expanded on in the future for management policies and education. Yes? I'm thinking if you could get two sets of cameras, it would be interesting to get data on what the human activity is in your three areas so yes. that you could document you know, what, how those variables panned out for defining your mm -hmm. So. It looks like I forgot to mention that. So actually at my study sites, so the natural area is the natural area. There's no trails nearby. But on the Old Gaswell Trail and on the Marsh and Ridge Trails, um, I am planning on having one camera facing towards the trail and one camera facing away from it. So trying to get some human humans on there. However, they are about two feet off the ground. So if I do get humans, I'm getting mostly their legs and their feet, avoiding identity and stuff like that. <laughs> Well, I, I can tell you, you're going to get my legs and <laughs> my legs because we take hardwood cuttings at that time of year in those areas. <laughs> All right, are there any more questions? Okay, so we'll start with there real quick. Uh, do you anticipate being able to recognize individuals and to uh, kind of document how many individuals you're recording? I, I hope so. I am not an expert on keeping track of individuals, but that is something that I want to get better at. So. If, I will be paying attention to like, you know, coloring, markings on them, and hopefully I can identify some individuals. That'd be really cool. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Dola from Mercyhurst University. And. Hi everyone, so I'm going to talk to you about a project that I've had going on now for six years um, at the James Preserve in Asbury Woods and it's still at its early stages in terms of data analysis and conclusions, but um, starting to get there and presenting at things like this is a way to kind of help me move that process along. So um, thanks for indulging me in that process. So, um, this is kind of the, the small stand, so it, it's pretty much the same. 
And if I were teaching a class right now, I might ask the students to start telling me what's different between the ones on the left and the right. It's kind of like those old highlights things that you have to, you have to figure out what, which things are different. Big difference in understory plant community, right? And what you can't tell quite so well also is a big difference in the overstory canopy cover. You can see that some of the trees have fallen down in the foreground here. There's a broken off top right there. There's another broken one in the background. And I can tell you that there's actually not even nearly as much canopy cover as it looks like from this angle because a lot of what you're seeing as leaves there are actual sprouts from the trees that have lost their crowns. So um, it's, it's a pretty dire situation for the trees in that spot and I'll talk more about that. So emerald ash borer, as a lot of you know by now, was introduced <clears throat> into the Windsor Ontario, Detroit, Michigan area in about 2002, although I've heard that that's up for debate actually. Um, the story is that it came in on um, wood pallets in the shipping industry and managed to spread to all these areas with red dots in just 20 years. Actually, this map came from 2021, so it, it, it should be updated from now. It's moved around by humans. I think it's interesting, you can see that process. Looks like somebody took a trip in southern Nebraska throwing wood out the back as they go. Um, and <laughs> distributed, distributed the beetle uh, as far west and looked, they eventually made it to Denver and uh, dumped some wood over there. Um, for the most part, it's still in, north, in, the, in the eastern US, although I heard there were some confirmed cases of it in Oregon this summer. Um, it is a bark beetle. It looks like this as an adult. It's actually a beautiful insect. Um, and it, like, our, like all bark beetles, likes to burrow into the bark. The eggs are laid on the bark by the adults. The eggs hatch, burrow into the bark, start eating in and around the cambium as they go, and they make these galleries. So, the, the, the bad thing for trees about bark beetles is the way they concentrate their eating on the cambium. The vascular cambium around the outside of the tree is where all the new cells are made. So if you destroy that cambium, you cut off circulation from the top of the tree to the bottom. And that's exactly where bark beetles like to feed. And they make these galleries. And after they kill the cambium, you can, you can pull off the bark and see those galleries pretty easily. On the left, we have an exit hole. The, Classic D-shaped exit hole is, is um, emblematic of the emerald ash borer. And the idea is the bottom part of the beetle that's curved is the, is the curved part, and then the top part is, is where the wings are. And you can actually Google it and find uh, videos of them emerging, which I find fascinating, because I never even see the adults. I've never seen an adult. I see these guys all the time. Those are the larvae. Um, they're kind of not very attractive. <laughs> Um, and then this is one of our tree tags over there on the left. Almost every photo that I have in here is from our plots. Okay, so before they arrived, we established two 20 by 20 meter plots in 2016 with the help of Jason Kilgore from Washington and Jefferson College and some of his students who were, who is already in a network of researchers doing long-term monitoring of emerald ash borer in, in forests. And so he came up and helped me establish part of the network here. Um, and so we're actually following network protocol when we do this. The protocol that I'm following was designed by somebody else. I've been able to add some components to it, but for the most part I'm doing what everybody who, do, who studies emerald ash borer in this network does and we actually post the data online and anybody in, in the network can access it and use it for research. It's also part of another network called, called ARIN, which is Ecological Research, I always forget what the second E is, um, network. And it's designed for small, primarily undergraduate colleges where professors need help from the undergrads to do research. Um, and it's, in addition to being a network as emerald ash borer research, it's a network for long-term forest monitoring. So I can plug students into these plots and they can do other things besides looking at emerald ash borer. And 
they also have access to all the other data from other people involved in that network. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool program. Our plots are 20 by 20 meters. We have two of them in the James Preserve. They're represented by the little X's over there along the Greenbelt Boardwalk, um, which Dr. Campbell built partly by himself back in the day. <laughs> and um, these plots are subdivided into, into 16 5 by 5 meter subplots. And actually, if I go back to this slide, you can see that's why we have the string out there because we're subdividing our 20 by 20 meter plot into these smaller subplots so we can keep track of where we've been. Because these are pretty dense, well they used to be, pretty dense forests um, and you really have to keep track of where you've been. So everything is sampled in the 20 by 20 meter area for trees, but then we go back into these random, um, three random 5 by 5 meter subplots and do some other sampling protocol on smaller um, smaller plants, the seedlings and saplings, and then the herbaceous plants, we, we monitor in those as well. Um, here is uh, some images of our sampling over the years. I managed to find one of every year except 2021, which apparently, I, we did sample that year, but for some reason I didn't, I almost always forget to take photos, and right as everyone's <laughs> putting stuff in their bag and get ready to leave, I have to say, wait, 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 Put your stuff down. <laughs> we have to take a photo. Um, so here we are over the years, um, and you can see what's interesting about this is you can see the changes in the forest as well. And most of these were taken right in our plots where we were sampling, and you can certainly see a big difference between the bottom three, or at least these last two, and the previous ones. And so those are all the different students that have helped me over the years um, in this project. So the main target species that we're after here is pumpkin ash. And um, emerald ash borer, of course, impacts all ash species. But what's unique about our plots is it's dominated by pumpkin ash, which is an endangered species and rare in Pennsylvania. In fact, the old maps suggest it doesn't exist at all in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's not true. These maps were developed back in the 1960s and they get passed down and now that's what pops up when you Google, when you Google pumpkin ash, but it's not even close to being up to date. But what is interesting about it is if you look at where pumpkin ash likes to live, we've got the Carolina Piedmont region, Mississippi Valley, Florida, and then tiny little dots here and there. It's a really interesting distribution. Um, and so it's no wonder it's endangered. It doesn't have a wide distribution. It is a wetland obligate species. It has to have wetland soils to survive. And in fact, the silvics of pumpkin ash, they talk a lot about how it really likes super wet soils. So it's in there with bald cypress and black gum and species that really like wet soils. It gets its name, I didn't know this until last night at 2 o'clock in the morning when I was finishing putting this talk together. It gets its name from the fact that it has a swollen base that looks kind of like a swollen pumpkin. I couldn't find a single picture that looked remotely like a pumpkin to me, but um, there's a funny second common name for pumpkin ash and it's called butt swell ash. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm going to switch to that and start calling it butt swell ash. Um, the students will love that. <clears throat> okay, so just some anecdotal evidence of when mortality really started to kick in in this plot. It most Mortality studies of trees show a kind of falling off. If, if, if you're thinking of survival, survival kind of falls off a cliff at some point. It's not a gradual one-to-one -one relationship. And it looks like our cliff point was from 2019 to 2020 is when mortality really kicked into high gear. Um, after that point, um, there's just the trees that were already almost dead are now completely dead. But there's a really big difference in mortality between those two years. Uh, but we need more than just that kind of evidence. So I've, I've started piecing together some, some data, and I have a lot more to do on this. But here are some data that I, I drew, um, drudged out of the, 
the spreadsheets that we have. So um, there are, for the most part, in both of these plots, the dominant species are pumpkin ash and American elm. American elm is an interesting comparison because it has its own problems, right? Dutch elm disease. If you look at just the number of live trees in 2016 and the number of live trees in 2022, you can see the differences there, pumpkin ash decreased by 63%, while American elm decreased a little bit, 16%. Sorry, these numbers are so low. That 16% is probably not far off of what you would expect normal mortality, um, especially for a species that has its own problems with disease. The other plot that we had, again, about 60, about two thirds of the trees are gone. Um, and then in that plot, that has a lot less American elm, it actually increased in number. That is not the same as mortality, I have to point that out. So what I'm doing there is just counting the number of live trees. If I looked at mortality, which is gonna take me longer to figure out because you have to trace each individual marked tree over time, um, that would probably be lower. Our mortality rate is probably actually quite a bit higher than 63%. Because it's including some new trees that have come in and some sprouts that have sprouted off of trees with dead canopies, if that makes any sense. Okay, so um, a lot of the, the next three slides come from one of my students, Hayden Petrick, who did his um, senior thesis on this. He put together this graph. Let me explain this for you. So across the x-axis at the bottom is ash rating, and that's a scale of tree health based on just visual um, quantitative scale. So we have one being a perfectly healthy crown, five being a completely dead crown, and two, three, and four being somewhere in the middle. And then we've lumped trees into where they are in the canopy. If they're completely overtopped by another tree. Uh, if they are in the canopy, that's uh, DC. And if they're somewhere in the middle, that's intermediate. So one of the take home messages here is it's the, it's the canopy sized trees that are dying at higher rates. Okay, so to give you a little bit more of a visual understanding of the ash rating, here are three trees side by side by side that would be a two, three, and a four. A one is a perfectly healthy crown. There's no one in this picture. But, but this would probably be a two on the left. It's still fairly healthy. Um, I wouldn't be super worried that that tree is not gonna make it to the next year. Here's a three. It's lost a lot of its leaves but it's still, still hanging on. Four is very, very, this one's very, very close to being completely dead, and then five would have no live leaves on it at all. We've used, we've had to use this scale to get early preliminary data on this project <clears throat> because it takes a long time for a tree to fully die. So this, using this ash rating scale helps us understand mortality before we actually get to mortality. So it's been kind of a way of looking at preliminary data. If we do look at mortality, and this is still um, not as thorough as the, the ash rating, what we have ranked by canopy class is 78% mortality in the dominant, co-dominant trees, 63% in the intermediate trees, but only 26% in the ones that are overtopped. That's a big difference. So that gave me a little bit of hope and that my original observation that started my student looking at this was that I could see that the little guys were doing okay. And so we started looking into this um, at more length. So what's interesting about this, and this actually comes from two different students' work on this, the adults move from crown to crown. That's what we're trying to represent here. And so we're trying to think through, okay, what is going on? Why are the little trees protected? Why, are they, why is their mortality rate so much lower? Kind of have two different main ideas right now. The first idea is, well, the adults are moving from crown to crown, they're ignoring the smaller trees. They're flying over the top of them. That makes sense, right? They're not even going to see those smaller trees. But at the same time, the other thing that you have to think about is they lay their eggs on the bark. And I would assume... Okay, so... So a couple of things that give me hope for the future for the species. The seedling abundance is, is nothing, uh, is 
definitely noticeable. I don't think it's gone down at all. In fact, it may have increased. Here's a, a shot of the seedlings just looking straight down. Here's a shot kind of from the side. These are all pumpkin ash seedlings. Very, very abundant. Um, it's gone up in abundance, at least in terms of, of cover over time. So those guys are the hope for the future for ash trees in general right now. I wonder if the initial invasion wave will be such that it will, the abundance of EAB will decline and possibly allow some of the saplings and seedlings to get back on that. We did, we did go in and look at seedling data for pumpkin ash and over time see that it hasn't really declined. The ones that are in red we had to get from a different source. Um, so they're not perfectly comparable. It's not exactly apples to apples. Can people have talked much about, and I don't think we really knew what was going to happen until we saw how the invasion was going to manifest in these forests. Pumpkin ash vigorously re-sprouts epicormically. So wherever the tree has been girdled, the, the insect works its way from the top down. And eventually, the top dies and the tree re-sprouts from below that point. Sometimes those new sprouts, and these are close to the base, but not exactly all the way at the base of the tree, sometimes they get really vigorous and really big. They're growing really fast, manageable level. Those guys can act as advanced regeneration for the next, for the next crop of, of ash trees. And uh, to some extent, they may root sprout as well. I actually put the, a question mark there because I don't know if if pumpkin ash root sprouts, but I definitely saw a lot of fast growing individuals look like they must be a root sprout because they were growing too fast to be, to be saplings. So, conclusions so far um, that I've made, and this is another one of my students standing next to the, the, one of the biggest trees that we found in our plot this past sampling year that, was, that still had a perfectly healthy crown. So, they don't get a lot bigger than that anymore. Um, so mortality rates of pumpkin ash are similar to published studies. What other published articles have shown is after about six years, you have mortality rates over about 80%. It looks like we're about there at this point. Um, but it is much lower for small trees. And, and we're, not, we're not brand new in making that discovery. It's not something I personally knew about when I started, but I have found that other published, other, other studies have shown that this, this, the smaller individuals that are managing to make it. Um, understory abundance of pumpkin ash is consistently high. <clears throat> it doesn't seem like it's gone down over time. Stem and root sprouts are vigorous. 